Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to the fireside chat that we're having right now. Uh, my name is Natalie Yeadon, and I just wanted to let you know that I'm the co-owner and managing director with a company called Impetus Digital, and I'm also the Toronto chapter lead for the transformative technology community. Um, and I know many of you are coming on from there, but from other places as well. So welcome to this meeting. If you're not familiar with Impetus, we are offering numerous cutting edge synchronous and asynchronous virtual collaboration tools. And we provide these with along with digital services for things like advisory boards, co-author working groups, medical education, internal meetings, et cetera. And this is, has been especially important since unfortunately the COVID-19 and a lot of people, life science companies that we work directly with um, have had to find other ways of converting their in-person meetings. Um, at Impetus, we believe that all great ideas start with a conversation. And so our online collaboration platform is really a perfect kind of milieu or place for starting these kinds of conversations. But for also for building on these ideas and insights that are gonna be generated over the long term, so longitudinally, by also helping to create authentic partnerships and relationships with the participants in the process. So we feel that having some of these big, hairy, audacious conversations is the start of the way for us to start implementing change and positively disrupting healthcare. So at, our, at Impetus Digital, we believe that this ties in really nicely with some of the passion project work that I do and that I know Ladana does and Thomas does with the Transformative Technology Lab. Um, and that is this collective community is looking and seeking to raise the well-being and flourishing of over a billion people by the year 2030. And we want to do this by trying to get exponential technologies associated with human and health system transformation into the hearts and minds of people across the globe. And so we want to thank you in advance for participating and being one of those many minds in helping in that transformation mission and goal. So with all of that said, the idea behind this particular fireside chat or webinar series, whatever you wanna call it, is to start that conversation around some of these big, audacious, controversial, sometimes thought provoking and very provocative ideas. And to discuss the opportunities and issues that the healthcare industry is facing today. Um, and also along with the technology that can be of assistance. So with that said, in today's conversation, we're gonna be speaking uh, with two of the people here who I'll introduce in a moment on the future of learning. So I think it's a very timely discussion. Um, and what does this all mean? And what is this gonna look like in the new normal as we all start to emerge out of self quarantines uh, from the COVID-19 pandemic? So with me today, I'm very happy and honored to have two people from Deloitte Europe at the table today to discuss this really interesting topic. Um, Ladana Edwards, who's with us today, is a partner at Deloitte Europe, and she's the co-chair of the TransTech community in Europe. She's been a partner at Deloitte working um, since 1999, and she works with multinational clients on talent, global mobility, and strategic human resources. She has a passion for the future and how digital disruption is going to change the way we all collectively communicate, how we work, and how we're going to live our lives. So she's a big believer on working on people empowerment, on technology, conscious leadership, and also this idea around new era thinking. Along with, her, with uh, Led, uh, Ledana is her partner in crime. Some of you, and I'm sure many of you know Thomas de Bruyne. He is a consultant at Deloitte, Belgium. And he is an organizational psychologist who is also a learning, a digital learning consultant. He, he has a strong passion for shaping the future of work and what it's going to provide in the future for optimal conditions to thriving for people around the table. He believes strongly in proper education and leadership, which is going to help shape that education, and believes that these are sort of key corner, cornerstones in the thriving world that we're going to be exploring and developing. Um, and it's really going to be the power of this virtual reality for immersive learning 
that's going to help um, build this thriving economy as well as the leadership that we're going to need. He's also actively looking into other areas of innovation where psychology meets technology. So we're going to want to delve into that further today. And his sweet spot specifically are in topics such as consciousness, flow, the human body, psychological safety, sleep, dreaming, art, VR, biofeedback, and a whole slew of other topics that I'm sure we're going to get into today. So without further ado, welcome Ladana and Thomas. So happy that you're here with us. Thank you for inviting us. Beautiful. Thank you, Natalie. Very glad Thank to be you. here. And I'm also really want, uh, happy that so many of you also came onto the line today. We're really looking forward to hearing from all of you. Please keep your questions on the back of your mind. Um, we've muted all of you, but we're going to be having a very casual fireside chat. Um, and then we're going to open it up to questions. So what I'm going to ask you to do is go under in the Zoom tool. You'll be able to find chat, put your questions in there. And uh, what we will do is um, find out what you're asking. And then we will ask you to turn your webcam if that's something that you're so inclined to do. And, uh, and, and we will go from there. So please use the chat function or raise your thumb uh, as a reaction to this and, um, and we will get your questions. So without, uh, so let's actually get started. Um, first of all, I wanna ask you how both of you um, kind of got started, how you even got together at Deloitte and really how this all kind of transpired around this topic of the future of learning. So Lenana, why don't we start with yeah. you? Yeah, I'll start since I'm the oldest, right? So <laughs> I, I would say, um, I would say I've been with Deloitte for about 20 plus years, and my work experience has really totally transformed who I am today. So you don't really think about it, but work is a transformational experience, and I'm very grateful for that transformation, but sometimes it's been super painful. Um, and there were two events that really kind of pushed me further on this journey, you know, not just to be the expert at Deloitte and the partner at Deloitte, but really start to think about like, who am I and what is my potential and how can I serve in this world and society through my work? So I had a baby at 41 and I was just about to ready to be partner and I was quite stressed and I Googled, you know, stress relief and I found meditation. So I did it just for stress relief, but it started really to opening my mind. It became my passion. And then um, about four years ago, I decided I wanted to try something new. I went to university at Cambridge University and I studied psychologically minded coaching for two years. And this was just totally opened my eyes about the different kinds of learning. You know, there's learning that I went to school for, which was how to be a great, you know, tax attorney, right? Uh, but there's the other learnings and, you know, how to, how you evolve as a human, especially in this time of like exponential change and shifting paradigms. It's not enough just to learn a skill. Like we have to be evolving ourselves to be, become more human at work. So um, these, these two things really kind of, you know, becoming a coach and coaching inside Deloitte and outside Deloitte, I realized how much fear and suffering we have in our system of work. And, you know, I thought it was just me, right? Because nobody talks about it. We're in a high performance culture. You don't talk about your kind of stresses. And uh, now it's starting to loosen up. So this became my passion. Like, how can we help people face their fear? The learning is really facing their fear um, and overcoming it and empowering them. And I also have a 12 year old son who loves VR and all these games. And I saw that when he's in the games, he's in this other reality and it's real for him. So we did a pilot two years ago with VR and coaching. So we put it together. We had a VR session. We did some coaching, breathing, grounding, different things. And then another session right after. And it was so transformational. I decided this is what I want to work on. So I put in Yammers at Deloitte. It was the first time I'd ever done it. And I found Thomas <laughs> and Thomas, and I started talking, we started talking about the different technology, we started talking about learning, personal growth and development and the role of large organizations in society. Um, and then it just became this beautiful journey for the past almost couple of years. It seems like a lifetime, but it's only been two years that we've been working together. So maybe I'll let Thomas tell his story. 
Thank you, Ladena. Um, yes, it was indeed through a Gemmer post, uh, Ladena and I first met. Um, and I'm relatively new to Deloitte and to the labor force in general. I'm 27 and I graduated about four years ago as an organizational psychologist. And I'm working now almost three years, three years for Deloitte in Belgium as a digital learning consultant. And in the year in between when I graduated and started uh, working for Deloitte, I went on a, well, look, we can call it a world travel. I, I visited a few countries, uh, stayed away for a year, and it was a completely different setting. And I remember when I was in my intake interview for starting at Deloitte, it was only two weeks after I was just in the middle of the Mongolian steppe. And those were just so different worlds. And uh, I'm glad that I'm relatively new. Now everyone starts speaking about the future of work, the future of learning, because it's for me, uh, it, it feels like I'm coming in with a bit of a fresh perspective. And after being after working for two years, more or less on digital learning, mainly developing e-learning content, digital content, and uh, working on strategy, learning strategy. I met Ladena through this Chamber post in which she described her virtual reality experiment for presentation skills or for overcoming the fear of presentation skills rather. And simultaneously, I was, um, I was in touch. I was connecting with some clients here in Belgium with some universities that were trying to bridge the gap on immersive learning and bridge the gap between academic research and the needs of the corporate world. And after I reached out to Ladena because I saw she was working on, uh, on the, the same topic, she just invited me over to Prague to have a design session, to come together with a few experts and to see how we really could move this forward and develop this. Um, and because we, we both thought this is a very impactful tool, it provokes different reactions and an e-learning, for example. And in, in my small career as a e-learning developer, I, I never saw two strong emotional reactions on e-learning. <laughs> and in the little pilot that Ladena did, two out of 12 people actually cried because they felt relieved to have found the channel that helps them get over the fear of presenting. So we started to delve deeper in this, and that's the journey of the two of us for the past year. Very exciting. So tell me a little bit about why this is important to Deloitte. Usually when I think about Deloitte, I'm thinking about consulting and that sort of thing. So what is the bigger picture behind this initiative and what is it you're trying to achieve from a larger objective standpoint? Well, I think it's important, not just for Deloitte, I think it's important for our clients, right? So, you know, the world is changing so quickly. Um, people are really stressed out. They don't really know how to handle this rapid change. And I think the best way that we can accomplish that is through learning and through, you know, helping our people um, be more authentic, be able to face their fear. So, so I think, you know, Deloitte used to be more kind of like process oriented or, you know, we, you have these various systems and we still do that work, but I think we're becoming more and more human in our focus. And, uh, in our human capital report for the past couple of years, it's all about human connection. And this year it was really about learning and learning organization and social organization. Um, so it's that responsibility of our clients to be good corporate citizens and to really understand the impact they have on their employees. And as David Berba says, and he's in this meeting today, behind every employee is a family, right? So our experience at work has huge impact and we need to be aware of that impact and we need to uh, take responsibility. So this is the trend I see and this is what uh, the Deloitte Center for the Edge research is showing. Yeah so, and I want to ask some more questions about the learn the concept of learning in general. So learning is just a, a gigantic topic that could require an entire academic course on. So when we're trying to frame learning what were some of the boundaries or riverbanks that you have created on trying to define what you're working on versus what's out of scope? So what, how are you, what parts of learning are you creating upon? 
Yeah, very good question. Um, I think in the in the past we've been focusing a lot on building expertise and building hard skills, as we call them. Um, that's also what uh, in my area e-learnings have been focused on. Um, and what we scoped out and where we really see the magic of VR coming in is for more human and interpersonal skills, uh, typically the kind of learning that comes with, uh, with emotions or that requires some emotional impact. And this is a stuff where VR is very good at. Um, and at the same time, when we, are, we were exploring different use cases for virtual reality to building those human capabilities, we got in touch with, or at least I got in touch, Ladina was, was already there before me, with John Hegel of our Center for the Edge in California. And he has been exploring and writing about enduring human capabilities. And it's especially these capabilities like empathy, imagination, creativity, um, collaboration, that we believe we, everyone will need more and more in addition to these deep expertise skills, hard skills. Uh, we will need these more and more in the future if you want to collaborate in an environment that's becoming more and more complex, more and more volatile. And that is where we scope our learning area with, with the use of immersive, immersive technologies. So I wanna linger on that and probably just, you know, uh, push a little harder on each of those core concepts. Um, so maybe I'll send this over to you, Ladana. So, you know, I think now, especially af after we're all sort of slowly and lazily emerging from self quarantine, and unfortunately through post COVID and hopefully most people on this line were not affected or their loved ones from a health standpoint. Um, but why are we focusing specifically on, on things like empathy and collaboration and you know, more of these, what would have been traditionally considered more woo woo and soft skills? Um, wh why is that kind of the focus of today? And do you see this being even more important uh, post-COVID than prior to COVID? Well, you know, I, I think it's the um, automation and robot, robots, you know, are able to do more and more of the skills, right? So we really distinguish between skills, uh, which if there's a process, you know, in the future, it might be, you know, automated. Um, so what will the humans do? And so this is why we believe that since everything is so complex and we really need to uh, kind of break the mold of being that expert and really bringing this vulnerability and becoming a learner again, this is a scary place to go. And so that's what we feel um, that we, we will help the people do is to really come back to the, as Thomas was saying, these enduring capabilities that we lost because we went to school and they kind of stifled them. They said, you know, uh, now, now it's time to stop playing, you know, um, don't be curious, just do the job. So I think that we have to relearn. We have to relearn and recapture those capabilities. And it's not so easy to, to do, you know. Um, so I think that this is really moved all those soft skills, I don't even call them soft skills anymore, they're power skills, right? These are the power skills for the future and there's lots of research and writing on it, but then how do we do it? And I, I think um, embodied learning is the best. And that's why I think VR can create those situations where people can play and try new things out that it's quite scary, like you know, communication, negotiation, giving a presentation, uh, all these things that are kind of human communication that can be kind of um, scary, especially in, you know, different hierarchical organizations. So I think this is why we have to practice this and technology helps us to do this in a safe space. So you bring a really good point here. So just kind of getting back to basics here. So what we're really suggesting or the premise behind some of this immersive learning or thinking is that there is a belief or assumptions that our world is gonna become roboticized. And we're already starting to see a lot of that taking place today, starting with artificial, you know, gener you know um, uh, basic intelligence going into artificial general intelligence. And then obviously we're all wondering about the date for the singularity. 
Um, and so there's this, this, everything is pointed in this direction. And so you're suggesting that in this new world of automation, um, we need to rethink how we are discussing education and how we're discussing skills development. So I want to talk a little bit more about immersive therapy, uh, immersive technologies in, in just a moment, but let's actually just linger a bit more on legacy. And so legacy institutions and the legacy and traditional ways that we've been educating. How do you see that modifying in the future based on this idea of roboticization, automata automation, um, and really what it is going to mean to be a thinking, evolving, contributing human in this new arena? So tell me a little bit more about the transformation of legacy to what we're doing today and what the future looks like. So Thomas? I think that's a better one for you, Lorena. Okay, I'll, sure, I'll take it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I've been working on reimagining education for some time. It has been uh, a challenge. I think we're so steeped and you know rigid in our traditional ways of learning. I think COVID has totally shaken the the car, the basket, you know. And um, I I watched my son, you know, have classes within three days online. Um, it's not perfect, but it is a way that, you know, that they can learn different. They can have content given to them differently. I read an article recently where they're actually, um, they have AI that can be the teacher and this personalization of uh, information. They can also have emotional uh, detection to see if they're bored or if they are confused. And then the content can be shifted to, to, the, to the individual. So for me, we had one size fits all and you had to fit that mold, but there's many different ways to learn. And with technology, we can actually start to focus on the individual child and help them kind of grow their talents and, and also understand where they may be struggling and adjust the needs. So I think that is one really exciting area. Um, but other than that, just like, what is this idea of like, you know, for me, I went to a lot of school and then school was done and then I'm an expert and I learn on the job. Um, and that, of course, is going to go away. It's going to be lifelong learning. Thank God, because it's so rewarding, right, to learn something new. Um, so I think the whole idea of, you know, our, especially in the U.S., these very expensive uh, brick and mortar universities that you go to, you get saddled with debt. Uh, and then you come out and, and try to try to find a job and survive, I think that's going to shift. I think people will start to have more content as they need it and in their interest and probably artificial intelligence that will help us guide us in the right areas of education. So I don't have a crystal ball and it's, you know, I think when I'm, what we're focusing on is more kind of the education, you know, once you get out of um, mm -hmm. university, but I am super excited what will happen to the, our traditional learning institutions. But I yeah. think yeah. The, the organization is a learning institution. Yeah, right. so work is a learning institution as well. Thomas, Absolutely. your thoughts um, on that? Yeah. Yeah, I think also on the technological side, we have seen a lot of uh, progress. Uh, what we see typically with our clients, and if we propose a roadmap together with them to move to a more engaging way of learning and a more uh, just-in-time, just-for-you personalized learning, uh, we typically see a progression from where a lot of learning was classroom-based and you had an instructor like we, we still have in school. Um, that that's telling us and, and providing us with content. Um, more and more of our clients are moving digital because it's more scalable, it's more personal, you can personalize it more and people can take it more at the time that suits them best. And that's when a lot of companies and people started moving towards digital learning and e-learnings. And there is definitely still a huge space and a market for this. But with the new technologies, and I, I'm very personally, I'm very excited about the combination of virtual reality 
uh, artificial intelligence to help personalize coaching within the VR environment and also biofeedback to give you um, multiple areas of feedback that help you grow and learn faster. So this is quite new technology that we're just figuring out how we can use this and design it so we can really have the best learning effects from it. So um, apart from the institutional and mindset shifts um, in regards to learning, I think the technology is also providing us new areas and new capacity for learning differently. So I think those are really great points. I think both of you raised an extremely important component, which is we're living in a world of personalization in a way that we've never had before. And if we think about the six Ds that Peter Diamandis often talks about, which is the digitization, the deception phase, uh, the dematerialization, demonetization, and democratization, this is kind of the flow that we're seeing as well in the learning education space. But part of that process of democratization, you could also use the word personalization, is we're now getting in, into a world where everything that we can learn is completely personalized to our chemical makeup, our biology, our personal capabilities, uh, you know, whatever sort of ways we wanna measure and meld that, it's gonna be a personalized way to do it. So I wanna talk a little bit more about mindset. So if this is such a great idea, Thomas and Ladana, why are, why are we not in capturing this that everybody is just going to go to e-learning and digital learning? And what are some of the constructs that are occurring in society today, either at a societal, educational, institutional, or workspace level that's creating some of the obstacles for um, the widespread acceptance of this? Mm -hmm. Maybe I can start, I guess. Um, I think, you know, before COVID, uh, it, it was sluggish. We were all practicing with, you know, trying out these different technologies and experimenting and piloting. COVID kind of forced us to start to use technology to connect. And I think that's really great. It's kind of pushing us further. But, you know, I, I think that there's a lot of people that are, want to go back to normal, <laughs> you know, and I, I, don't, I don't think that we will be going back to normal. So I think there's resistance and changing the world we, we we are changing so quickly it's crazy the last five ten years you know the advancements we've made and how our lives have changed and i think just a lot of people are not really comfortable with that i can tell you in deloitte you know i'm, I'm one of the crazies right you know, you know friendly but crazy right so i see this future uh that can be really amazing but it takes time and what i'm learning is that we have to be better communicators uh, really envisioning a future that isn't like so far out, but really bringing that kind of practical application and why it's important. So this is, I think, a challenge for all of us that see that future, that beautiful future that we want to get to is, you know, how can we be more, have more empathy and understanding um, and compassion for the people that that's really a scary place to go and, and really start conversations like this. You know, have these conversations and don't get, you know, on your soapbox about it, but really just try to bring people in and let it kind of organically, organically grow. So, and I love that. I love that as well, too. If anybody's read uh, James Clear's book, Atomic Habits, everything in life starts with these 1% incrementals. And just like the beautiful world of compounding interest, 1% every day changes the world's habits. So... Uh, something that I think is very encouraging. But I do think that we have infrastructure, we have legacy and um, heuristics, automaticity that sometimes can serve us very well because our brains are lazy. Um, and that was just, you know, helps us from an evolution standpoint to reside on habits, but sometimes that can be a disservice. So uh, hopefully we can move that forward. So Thomas, as it relates to um, uh, talking about some of the methodologies for new skill building. Maybe we can spend a few minutes talking about some of the exciting things that you have been seeing or things that are being um, employed right now around virtual reality, augmented reality. You were talking about neurofeedback. Maybe you can give us some background on some of the experimentation that you and Deloitte are working on. Yes, for sure. 
So one of the most exciting conversations I had lately was uh, when I went to Barcelona to meet with Mel Slater. And Mel has been doing research on virtual reality, empathy, identity for the past 30 years. So he's really one of the first pioneers. I believe he's actually the first pioneer to really have done this extensive academic research in Barcelona around virtual reality. And we were talking about uh, virtual reality, which he sees as a huge empathy tool. And one experiment he did, and it's quite common, it's quite commonly known now in, in the virtual reality world, is that you give yourself counseling by telling your uh, and anything that doesn't sit well with you to Sigmund Freud, who is sitting in front of you uh, as a psychologist. And then you push the button and you switch uh, and you are Sigmund Freud. You hear yourself talking to, to the Sigmund Freud and you are able to provide feedback and guidance. And this method proved to be very, uh, very impactful for people to just self-coach themselves. And why this was so impactful is because virtual reality can do crazy things about your concept of identity and self, uh, especially with the embodiment. If you are put into another character and in a, in a different setting, you let go of your ego triggers that you have in normal life and your mind uh, is much more open to be rewired and is much more open to taking another perspective. And if you do this the right way, because there is also ways that, that can actually help you achieve the, the opposite effect. But if you design it consciously and wisely, then you can build more empathy. And after this experiment, this initial experiment with Freud, um, they also experimented with, for example, Obama, with Michelle and Barack Obama, and also with Steve Jobs. For uh, with Steve Jobs, it was about imagination and creativity. And you saw that when you change the environment to a different person, a different setting, you can cultivate different skills and you can trigger people in different ways to develop different capabilities and skill sets. So that was something that was very, that I was very excited about. Right. Interesting. So I um, want to talk a little bit about some of the issues around the, the technology. Are we talking about like ocular, Oculus lens? Um, what are some of the technical requirements for doing some of this? And, and is this become, or could this become a bit of an issue? And where do you see the future of the actual technology? Mm -hmm. Well, the big breakthrough in virtual reality was when the Oculus Quest was introduced to the broad public. And I've got one of them uh, myself at home here. And before the quest was revealed to the public, it was a very clumsy setup. You had to set up trackers and uh, quite a big space. And it took quite some time to set it up well. And with the Oculus Quest, everything is just in one device. Uh, it's very easy to set up. You can jump into virtual reality quite easily. Um, but this is for the consumer market. Uh, there are many other different virtual reality headsets out there that serve different purposes. Um, but there has been a big breakthrough in the capabilities of VR headsets, which makes it much more easy to bring more people into virtual reality and help them learn. Um, so this has been a big breakthrough. I also think that the combination of augmented, um, no, sorry, of artificial intelligence, uh, which people start to use, uh, start to use in, in coaching in personalized coaches based on biofeedback. I see early experiments going on in this, but this is the point that we are at. And so, so I see a lot of opportunities. And at this moment, I think the biggest blocks in terms of technology are especially in the availability of technology, especially in these COVID times, uh, supply chain have been disrupted. There has been some delays in the production of these headsets. Um, and it's not finding its way to, to a lot of people. So we, we actually wanted to set up our next trans tech event in June for the Prague chapter that uh, Lede and I are, are driving. We wanted to include some kind of virtual reality components 
but we realized that probably not a lot of people have the, the luxury of having a headset at hand. So I think that's the biggest roadblock at the moment. But the technology is ready and I think it will be a matter of years before people will have a headset or the capability to dive into virtual reality with all the add-ons in the coming years. So um, just talking about the technology, I mean, many of us <clears throat> might, well, not many of us, but some of us might remember some of the technologies like DVD players and Blu-ray players. Some technologies did really, really well. Others just kind of hit and nosedived and something else came, came in its play. And so in some ways, we kind of asked ourselves the question about some of these new ways that we're starting to forage in, in careen into VR and AR and, you know, is an Oculus lens the most practical way? Some people might actually have suggested that the Google lens might have been ahead of its time, might not have been there at the right time. But could you see the day where we're walking around with some little attachment um, the side of our glasses or some other potential way, some sort of an in retinal implant where you'll become the bionic person that we, we see or some of these sci-fi movies where suddenly I'll look at LaDana and then I can just use my neural link in my brain to, to, to code me to get information on her CV so I can actually do her bio without having to pop up my computer. Is that, is that like way ahead of the future of these things that people are actively discussing? Um, it's something that already has been developed to some extent. And I'm trying to think of the name of the company. It was a US-based company. Um, I can't remember their name right now, but they developed a lens that you just well, put in like a normal, like a regular contact lens. And it's able to provide you with basic augmented reality overlay on the real reality. And that was also a trend that a colleague of us within Deloitte, Aaron Exu, who has been in the VR space for several years now, this was a trend that he was predicting one and a half years ago. And I think the technology is getting there. It will take us some more years to develop it. And I'm not sure in which form it will take hold, but it's not a sci-fi as most people think. Yeah, so it's all pretty fun and cool, but depends on your mindset. We were mm -hmm. talking earlier about fixed versus growth mindset. So unfortunately, depending on what camp you look at, you may look at it as being very scary, or you could look at it like being very excited. So I want to just uh, step out uh, for a few minutes and talking about the fact that there's technology, the fact that there, there's other components associated with it requires a certain level of education and mindset. Do you foresee there being an access issue? Um, the whole premise around nobody left behind. Um, how does that fit into this new world that we're delving into? Maybe, that. I, can, maybe I can take that one because we were with Thomas, we were working with a client and uh, they want to be a number one learning organization. And one of the things that is in their goals is to democratize learning, right? So like, uh, in the past, leaders, you know, had certain kind of really expensive learning, and now they, they have a culture where everybody's a leader, right? So um, this is very important. So when we were looking into VR is how can we use, you know, cheaper VR, but if it's not VR, uh, it can be, you know, a flat screen. So we were also working uh, to how can you just use a tablet or your computer and still maybe uh, feel like you're on a Skype call instead of being in the virtual world. So I think there's different kind of layers to this. Um, I think the cost of the equipment will come down. Uh, in the offices, they'll probably have equipment in the various offices that people can take and, you know, use for whatever, uh, for learning, for teaming, for, uh, I think now, especially with COVID, you know, it can be a lot cheaper to get several VR and, and you can work and on a project together where before we would be in a physical space, we'd go through some sprints. We're trying to figure out how to have digital platforms that we can actually do these labs together. So I think I, I, I think that business will start with this and but the price will come down and over time, just like the iPhone, you know, the smartphones, right? Most people yeah. have a smartphone now. So and I don't think it will really take that long. I think other cheap devices will come out. So so I, I think it is a step-by-step -step approach. And what we're trying to do is there's the traditional learning 
There's learning in VR, which actually could be cheaper than people physically going to another country to learn, which a lot of times you will see. Or you could do it uh, on your computer, but in this more kind of virtual world feeling uh, with uh, cameras on, so everyone's connected. So I think there'll be this combination of all this technology together. Yeah, and I certainly agree with you. I think that there has to be this tiered approach and it's gonna be a multi-pronged approach where there's gonna be several like, realities existing concurrently in the learning environment. So talking about the future of that is we put a, a large amount of credence currently on credentialing, giving people initials behind their name, going through the legacy systems uh, Ivy League schools, et cetera. Um, there's a lot of discussion going on right now because of COVID-19 is what is, the, what is the new university life going to look like? Yes. Um, we've got this almost dual, um, duopol, you know, duopol, du, a monopoly with a two-tier university system. So if you don't get into the Ivy League, you go into the others, but this is the only time in history where you're having people pay the same amount of money for a Volkswagen as you do for a Ferrari. So it just meant that you didn't, go, you didn't get into the Ivy League school. So, but with all of this being rethought, and we're now in a place where perhaps you don't need to go to a brick and mortar. Perhaps the new world is going to be the Coursera's of the world or the Udemy's or the, you know, Edex's of the world. Is how are we going to measure knowledge? How are we going to measure your skill set so that you're going to be ready for whoever's going to hire you or your ability to do something in the world that's worth value? I don't know. Do you, Thomas, do you want me to start? And you're the more learning expert, but maybe yes. I'll give my two cents in and then hand it over to Thomas. Go ahead. As I've been waiting for this for a long time, you know, uh, originally being from the U.S., I've seen how the cost of education has skyrocketed and it's really, uh, it's very sad to see uh, the impact on people's lives after they get out of university. So I am a big fan of this, you know, more digital learning. Um, and it, it also levels the playing field a little bit. So it's really on your ability to learn and your ability to apply that learning and through lifelong learning, instead of going to a university for four years and then getting out in six years and getting out and finding a job, you know, maybe you go to some sort of, some of it's in physical spaces, but then a lot of it is digital and you, you learn as you, you need it and you have experiences, right? So instead of cramming all your learning into a certain period of your life, it's lifelong learning. Some of it's digital, some of it's in person, but how do we repurpose that brick and mortar, right? So I still think we need to get together. You know, we do still need this connection, but not every day, right? And I feel like now that I cannot actually reach out and physically be with people, I'm actually more connected now than I have been in probably a good 15 years because I'm talking and seeing people uh, on Zoom. And mm. it was crazy for me how much more humanly connected I feel I am now than before. So what COVID did for me, at least, is open my eyes just how well we can adapt to this technology and make it humanly connected and be able to learn. But there are like certain criteria that you have to turn on your camera, right? You have to be engaged. Uh, there'll be some etiquette, you know, we'll learn how to deliver uh, learning in, in this digital form. It's very different than when you're in a physical space. So I think that will be very interesting mm -hmm. to, to watch. And Thomas, do you have thing. anything to add to that? Yes, um, another thing I'm seeing, um, and from my personal experience as well, is that more people become aware that sharing knowledge and collaborating with each other um, is actually much more rewarding than just keeping all your knowledge for yourself, working your little bubble. And that's also the way that Ladena and I have gone about with our virtual reality efforts, just reaching out to, um, to experts within the space, uh, to our clients, and co-create the solution together, which actually isn't a um, standard project where we as Deloitte come in as the experts and do everything. But we, it's more like a learning journey for everyone involved. 
And I see that this mindset is spreading to more people. And um, some courses, for example, of Stanford University um, are just being put integral on YouTube. I'm following one myself on evolutionary biology. And um, all this knowledge is accessible to much more people, to many more people. And um, which I think is a great thing. But then the question which you started with is very valid. How do you measure um, which knowledge, which skills, which capabilities you build? And how, you de how do you determine, especially in regulated environments, whether a per person is fit or is trained to do the, to do the job well? And I think there's multiple alternatives for this, for multiple settings. Um, and the way that we used to assess skills, which um, comes very well, very clearly across in a standard CV, is that you list your job experience and somehow people derive your level of intelligence or experience or skills and capabilities from these job titles and based on this and an intake um, conversation i hope they make a decision um, now learning technology has also advanced um, xapi for example um, is a technology that can help you track um, who did what um, it's an algorithm it's a structure in which you can track thomas followed a stanford course on evolutionary biology you can use the same um, the same structure um, for any learning ac activity and add it to a personal record. Or you can work with a system of open badges, for example, that show you that you followed some kind of course. And uh, so there are multiple technological ways to keep track of activities, of learning activities and achievements. And next to that, I think there is also a mindset change where the expertise still is, a, is an import, important component, but the capabilities that someone can show. And before this call, I was just discussing the same thing with Ladena, um, that the capabilities become more and more important because the job that you will, that you will be applying for isn't very likely to remain stable over the coming two years even. Um, so the um, potential to learn and the speed at which you can learn will become more relevant than the actual education you have taken in the past. And these two will still coexist uh, next to each other, but the capabilities and the capacity to learn quickly I believe will be more important than the complete XAPI track record of all the different kinds of trainings that you've been going through. Yeah, I think those are great points. Now, I want the uh, audience who's here to start thinking about questions. I just realized that the chat function was not opened on here. So if you can click the reactions area and actually raise your hand if you have a question. I'm going to ask a question now. But if anybody has any questions, please raise your hand and then we'll get you to unmute potentially share your camera, and then you can ask the question directly. Uh, I will get to you in one moment, Conrad. Um, so my last question potentially for this is really a, a, to um, linger a little bit on what you had just mentioned, Thomas, which is this new reality and how we're going to onboard people. And I like to kind of think about it as onboarding and offboarding, because the work reality in the future might look very different than it is today. Perhaps we're going to live in a world of very much of a gig economy where we might actually have simulated games as we onboard people. You kind of surf on, you kind of find out what that company does, you kind of onboard, you work for them for a bit, and then you go find another kind. And you just kind of surf through a variety of different ways to work for companies. And they use game simulation um, as a way to test your knowledge, see if you get what they're doing. Um, what's your thoughts on the different possibilities of, of the work environment and how people are going to be onboarded and offboarded? Any thoughts? I'll let Thomas take it. He's the expert. Okay. <laughs> well, I believe the, um, I, I was actually involved in building the onboarding program for Deloitte in Belgium this year. Um, and it also has taken quite a turn with the whole COVID situation. Because normally we did it in big groups. We had about 200 people joining in September. 
and we can't very likely we can't bring a big group like this together and we've been rethinking how can we really um, create a, an onboarding experience that is relevant to our people and which will empower them to do the jobs and especially as a consultant you need to be very flexible but you need to have some kind of feeling with with the company you you'll start working for and know your teams and etc so what we uh, focused more on was not developing some specific skills but more consulting skills as we call them uh, which, which go with the human capabilities we mentioned it's more broadly applicable skills like presenting open dialogue critical thinking and these we we set up sessions for this and next to this we we also still believe it was very important to let people experience the values which we stand for as a company um, and through through interactive exercises and by communicating visualizing them integrating them in the exercises we ask them to do and apart from this kind of design and content the technology through which we do it instead of having it all classroom delivered we're starting to look into other ways uh, more digital ways and personalized ways in which the 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 people who get on board that also can give feedback and get personalized learning experience which might me be more relevant to them um, instead of just a one size fit all onboarding where you just put everyone together for one or two weeks and expect them to be up and running. Yeah, fantastic. So I'm actually going to go to Conrad Ruiz now. Conrad, I don't know if you have your webcam, but you're unmuted if you want to go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, um, sorry, I was, uh, I was also on my computer and my, it's because it doesn't have video. So I'm actually on my phone as well. Um, you can, I, I, I would love to show my face if that's all right. Um, I love interacting sure. with people in that way, and we're, it's been a while <laughs> since I've seen Okay, so go ahead and start your video if you like. Oh, thank you. Hi. There you go. Um, hey. So um, I am working on a startup called WellAware, and one of my biggest focuses as a, um, I guess, a time analysis performance coach has been um, helping clients self-observe. I think I think one of the things that's been interesting in the context of like the future of learning, um, the future of understanding like what's going on and what's what everything's about. Like to me, well aware is this concept where um, we don't necessarily always know. We are we're usually unaware of what are the possibilities, opportunities, things we can take advantage of for our time a day. Um, we sometimes become aware of things, but they are either too overwhelming to understand, or we're not necessarily in a position to figure them out. Um, just at this time. And so we need help, we need assistance. I think sort of being well aware is that position where you move beyond those two steps and you're now fully able and ready and you, you can take on an opportunity and you know what's out there. Um, and, and so to me, my question was about this idea of like the future of learning, um, specifically where self-observation is observed. I think it's interesting that um, amongst all the things that people are worried and fearful about is that they just don't understand things. There's, there's a sense of uncertainty because they don't understand. Um, and I always like to start with the lack of understanding at the self. What don't you understand about yourself? What don't you understand about what you know, about what your goals are, what actions, how your actions impact or take performance on your life, what relationships are going to be important to you, and ultimately how you're best going to spend your time. I'm just curious what you guys have thought about that kind of self-observation as a service, if you will. Um, maybe for clients on a professional level, but I'm very much more focused on like the personal development, personal understanding kind of side of things. Absolutely. And I think it's relevant to anyone, whether you're working in, co in corporate business or whether you're just a consumer. And this is what I was very excited about when I heard about the Freud experiment of Mel Slater. Because for really taking this distance and reflecting and becoming aware of your ambitions or the way that you've been doing things, um, it helps to be put in a different environment, um, away from your normal daily triggers uh, that keep you in this automatic mode. So uh, well, virtual reality is one way to provide it. Meditation is another very powerful technique. And uh, this is... Uh, I believe one of the key building stones of personal development and learning. Because before you can change something, you is, should at least start with being aware of your behaviors and, and then seeing and observing 
what do I want to keep? What do I want to change? But taking this distance and reflecting is a very powerful and important step. Yeah, and maybe I would add, I think awareness is key. Um, I said, you know, Deloitte has been my biggest teacher. Uh, there was a lot of things when I was, you know, young and new in Deloitte. I had certain behaviors and I wasn't aware of my impact on others. Uh, and so I think it's really important. And that's what transformational learning or adding this extra layer of transformational learning when we talk about learning is so important. And it is about how we can become more aware. So any tool that can bring awareness to us as individuals, then as we evolve as individuals, uh, so does the organization for which we work and the system which we operate. So for me, how do we transfer, transform the world? Uh, we start with the individual. And we start with the individual to transform our teams and to transform uh, into a conscious business and society. So. Conrad, I just want to add to that. I think it's a brilliant question. I love whatever business model is that you're working on. I think the oh idea of self observance Sorry, I think the idea around self-observance as a, as a service is, is brilliant. And quite honestly, um, you know, as we look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs and we think that the top tier was self-actualization, in fact, the next echelon is transcendence. Transcendence, right. And so um, these are just the, these are gonna be the new, the new realm. This is gonna be the new economy. Um, as we all start to indulge into the gig economy and you know, I know we're, there's tons of things we could talk about around what does the UBI look like? And is it really gonna be UBI or do we start selling our data as, as a service? Healthcare data, brain data, how we're learning, um, uh, things like uh, uh, facial recognition software and you know, our TVs reading us and paying us to watch TV. So is that UBI or are we actually just selling, selling, uh, selling um, data? But um, anyways, I think, um, unfortunately, we're hitting the hour. Um, thank you very much, Craig, for your question. Um, I am going to actually, uh, we actually could be speaking for a long longer on these topics. Um, everything from blockchain to privacy to bioethics and the conversation could go on and on. So I'm sure we'll be speaking to you, Ladana and Thomas, somewhere down the future to find out how your experiments and some of the great successes that you've overcome at Deloitte with your clients. Um, and I think this just is a bigger topic. I think it'd be in really interesting to see another year how some universities might be resurfacing as a completely new entity and uh, potentially how work environments are gonna be doing onboarding and offboarding, I think, in the future. So I uh, wanna thank our audience for sticking around uh, for some of the questions that have come through. My apologies that the chat was not working. I want to thank you, Ladana and Thomas, for some of your brilliant ideas um, and very much looking forward to hearing about some new things that you're working on. Thank you. Thank, thank you for having Anthony. us. Awesome. Have a thank great you for day. Us. Thank you so much, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your day. You too. Cheers.